Hey. Hey, I'm so sorry. Uh, let me try also to put the the image on the um the video. I mean, camera. Camera is on. Yeah, let me see if I can unclick it for you. I, I don't need the camera, but um... it's up to you. Um, I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, it was my fault. I, I forgot about the appointment, and then when I got your second email about let's try seven o'clock, I got that one hour later. That's so strange. Well, you know, maybe next time, like I I had sent another email, but maybe do you have WhatsApp? Do you do you use that yes, at all? Yes. Okay, that might be easier. Um, because I think it's like it's pretty much instant um instead of emailing maybe that might be better um how are you i'm fine uh good, good. We, we were working all weekend on the budget for the museum so oh that sounds fun i send my mobile number in the chat if you can see it okay let's see um there yeah let me just click on the chat oh great okay let me just write that down mm -hmm. um so my my questions, there's not many. Some of it's just clarification from our, our other conversation that we had back in October. Um, but I did get stuck on, on one area because I was trying to uh, bridge a gap um, in a timeline um, from when uh, I um, when ICOM first made its um, 1956 through 1959 um, definition. Yes. And then and then AEOM came on board in 1966, and then they had their definition in 1972, and then it just stops. Um, and so there's nothing. There's no other. I mean, it just, it's just dormant. Like this, this definition just never evolved. Um, so that's, that was curious to me. I mean, I, I know that you mentioned in our last conversation that AEOM that you believe did not ever update their, their um, definition, but um, is there a reason why ICOM, even though they update their museum definitions fairly often um, that they just decided not to update the open air museum definition um well indeed you're right. first of all you're right indeed icom um redefines let's say the museum definition roughly every 10 15 years or so mm -hmm. i think uh but i aum i have I, I have the yearbooks which well it's not yearbooks but they publish about roughly every two three years a, a volume Mm. and uh, many of them have digital maybe i've shared them with you um if not i can still do that uh, but i see nowhere in those yearbooks since the 70s any new reconsiderations about should we change our definition because uh i can change their definition and uh i would say the aum definition and also the exarch museum definition they depend partly on the ICOM definition, but the more important reason is ICOM updated their definition because the world changed. Right. Well, that's the same world that changed for AOM and for Exarch. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit surprised that AOM never updated their definition, which is, what is it, from 1974 or so? Right. And so it's interesting because we have all these different types of open air museums, as you're well aware of, and it's that this and they're they're basing, I don't know if basing is the right word, but they're they're building upon this this ancient definition, and and it kind of it kind of you know it doesn't help open air museums or it doesn't even help establish open air museums if you're looking at this archaic definition because you know it's. It gives like a false pretense of what an open air museum is, and if you're trying to put yourself in 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 that definition and and trying to I don't want to say force either because that's a that's a big word, but if you're trying to mold an open air def mold your own open air museum into one of these definitions, it just doesn't really work. 
No, so the question is, who is this definition for? Or who was this definition for in the early 70s? Right. And um, why isn't it important anymore? Right. Um, I, I, I know that uh, uh, an important reason for AEOM to exist, to start in the 60s, 70s, was to be able to communicate between Western European and Eastern European museum colleagues, directors. Mm. Uh, that was a very, I mean, that was one of the main reasons to uh, to start, as far as I know. It's not the main reason why they exist right now. Um, it has always been a club, indeed, of directors for directors, so a, a kind of gentleman's club. And, and very uh, looking inward, as far as I can see, because, mm. indeed... Um, if they never come to, I, I have not seen them at ICOM meetings in the past 15 years. Mm. I have not seen them uh, seeing any publication or so of AUM or any presence uh, anywhere uh, else except for at their own conference. The mm. only thing I know what is the only part of them which is active, reasonably active, is about uh, education, and, and that's in Sweden adult education but that's um also not linked with icom not linked with nemo not linked with other international organizations as far as i can see so i think for them this definition is not important and i don't know why it was important in the early 70s but it certainly hasn't been important over the past 20 years mm -hmm. so you know with, with... Uh, their the, the museums I think also if you look at you, we could look at the members. I haven't done that, but expect the museums which were member in the seventies, ninety percent of them are still member. So there's a very little change, I guess, in who is member and who not, and therefore very little need to say, do you fit in our definition or not? Gotcha, gotcha. So if there were a new wave of members, then perhaps they would re-examine that definition yeah and if we look worldwide in, into that uh, ethnographic type of museum that uh, that they represent i think the most of them started in the 50s 60s 70s and i wonder how many of them started in the 80s 90s and later mm. not many i think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, my husband has a question <laughs> yes of course <laughs> Well, although there hasn't been a definition provided by any of these uh, kind of overlord <laughs> organizations, um, there has been the creation of the European Root of Industrial Heritage, which kind of oversees industrial sites throughout Europe, including all the way into Siberia, which is actually Asia. But has that impacted how some people view open air museums simply because of the existence of the EROI, or is that well? The the, the uh, uh, ERA. you give too much authority to organizations. <laughs> I mean, the European cultural roots. There are about twenty or so of them. Mm -hmm. Are just a very loose network. Each of them of like minded uh, colleagues. Uh, they have no authority whatsoever. They don't have money whatsoever. They just have an email list. Mm. So it's it's literally it's purely a, a network of email yes. people on yes. email, and they can send visitors to each other, but they don't really have any power over. Mu music they have knowledge. no power. Um, it might be good for them to be part of that network. So they may be more interesting for funding, right? But they have to do it all by themselves. Mm -hmm. I see. So they don't have any authority. I mean, if uh, they decide to uh, to quit, Europe doesn't care. European Union, mm -hmm. or the European, uh, yeah, it's the European Union. I think they're dependent on. That's interesting. Sorry. No, sorry. no, no, no. But, but uh, that... I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's no. a good question. Um, so let's and see. also the AUM you shouldn't see as the authority on ethnographic open air museums yeah. they're not 
they're just a network of friends. The same as Exarch is just a network of friends. We have no authority whatsoever. Mm. So ICOM really is the authority? Worldwide, um, well, I would say the authority, uh, they have an advisory capacity. That's all. Oh, okay. They, okay. they are also just a network, but it's a very big network. Mm -hmm. But if you look in certain countries, then let's say um, ICOM India, to name one, just as an example, possibly is coordinated by the Ministry of Culture, possibly. It happens in a lot of countries. And the Ministry of Culture in India, yes, they have authority in India, but ICOM India doesn't have authority. It becomes state-run, then, as far as the, the ultimate authority is how a particular region governs itself. In yes, exactly. And, and indeed, let's say the, the ICOM National Committees, I think maybe half of them are under the ministry of their country and the other half are independent organizations. Oh, that's interesting. Is that... huh. So these are more <laughs> suggestions than anything. <laughs> the, the, the ICOM definition is um, whatever you want to make of it. I mean, um, in some countries, in their law, they refer to the ICOM definition, sure. but then the, the the law is the the, the defining thing, so to say. Uh, that's it. Um, just to name something. Let's say Scotland uh, says in their law, well, if to if, to be defined as a museum, we look at the ICOM definition. Well, then it's a choice of the government of Scotland to do as, as such. But ICOM, in in general, is just an advisory body. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. Okay, well, that makes sense, and that and that kind of probably is why there's just so much confusion of what an open air museum is because you have all these advisories. Yeah, well, the the, the problem if if uh, let, let's take Spain for example, the mm -hmm. national government can say something or not, um, the the region Catalonia can say something or not, the city of Barcelona can say something or not, and that's each each time at a lower level, mm -hmm. and and it depends just. Is there any 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 did anybody say something already? Yes or no? And 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 it's a patchwork of of of, of laws and rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. And you could be lucky if if indeed at a national level something is said, but it doesn't happen very often. And mm -hmm. even so, then they don't really define that very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the main reason why they don't define what is a museum, for example, is because the moment they define that, they are also afraid, okay, if somebody fits into that, then they can apply for money, maybe. Mm -hmm. They're afraid of, 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 of um, the, I think local and national authorities are afraid that this could lead to requests or demands for, for, for support. Oh, interesting, okay. And and then on, on the one hand, uh, I mean, if, if you divide museums in two ways or one hand is the museums started or uh, run by the local government financially and the other ones are not i think that's much more defining if uh, uh, let's say um uh, an open air museum can indeed be so can be uh, founded by the local city local municipality and then they are responsible a to z for it Definition doesn't really matter. There mm -hmm. can be a museum or there can be a shoe store or whatever. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have uh, people saying, well, I find it so interesting. I start my own museum independently and it can still be defined as a museum by anybody, but it doesn't mean they get funding. They only get funding if they are one or the other way incorporated uh, into the, the local government structure or if they, for example, have like, like we do, our museum here in Denmark, we are an independent foundation, sort of, mm -hmm. uh, independent of the of the local authorities. But we have a contract now for four years that they fund us with, uh, let's say, twenty five percent of our budget. And mm -hmm. this is a this this kind of contract is renewed every four years. It gives us stability. But they don't care if we call ourselves a museum, a chill children playground, 
or or or, or whatsoever. Mm-hmm. I'm 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 sorry. I'm I'm trying to paint it a bit black and white. So uh, <laughs> no 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 no. That's it's, that's helpful. It's no that. Yeah, I'm not answer. pessimistic. I'm not pessimistic, but it just sounds like oops. <laughs> right. No, but that does answer a lot of a lot of little a lot of little things in this paper. Um, um. Cool. Thank you. Um, I have two more questions for you. Go ahead. Okay. I have, pl- I have plenty of time. Okay. So the the next question, um, um, when it comes to public history, um, I couldn't find really anything that would, you know, about public history, like public history versus uh, an open air museum. Like, what's what's the difference and what's the similarity between a public history site and an open air museum? That's a good question. I mean, it, 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 how do you define a public history site? I mean, um, it could be a historic house or um, a place where something happened, something something important happened, I would say, is a public history site. Would you say so? Yes, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Well, one of the- um, I think the difference between one and the other is that if you look at uh, a museum how I would see a museum is that I would say there's a fence around it and there's a controlled entry. Mm. That's what, I mean, take Colonial Williamsburg. There's no fence around it. You can walk in anytime. Difficult to call that an open air museum in Mm. my eyes. Mm. I would say um, that's a site where you can walk in, walk out. Uh, A national park is also a site. So having a gate around our compound in a way gives us more credibility to become an open air museum as opposed to... I don't think you need a gate around your uh, property to to gain credibility. I don't think you need to use... You have to use the word museum to gain more credibility. Mm -hmm. If it's a historical site or an open air museum... Uh, for um, politicians, they don't see much of a difference. It's more for 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 nerds, so to say. Okay. And 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 I think a lot of activities on an op- on an, on a historical site can also be done in an open air museum. Hmm. That is yeah. fascinating. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, it's it's a it's a it's a gray zone also um le, le, I, I i i sometimes take the example let's say you have somewhere in the forest in germany somebody reconstructed a roman tower and the roman tower from 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 the roman army back uh, 2000 years ago it stands there in the forest mm-hmm. and no fence around whatsoever people can pass by of course the door's locked and one time a year to have a weekend a big festival and 10,000 visitors come to the forest, have fun, and and uh, good quality or whatever, that doesn't really matter. But is that a, that's a site, it's not an open air museum, I would say. But it doesn't really matter. What's the name of that site? I'm sorry. No, there, 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 there are several of these uh, in, in, in Europe. There are only in German alone, I think there are 20 or such Roman watchtowers uh, along, along the, the, the old Roman border uh, reconstructed like they have been 200, 2,000 years ago. And some of them even indeed organize once per year an event, a festival, and the rest of the year nothing is happening there. But such a festival is usually paid for or supported for by the local council. And, and um, a lot of uh, often, uh, it's uh, an open air museum can often start this way with an event once per year, and then there's more interest and more interest, and slowly it turns into an open air museum with um, every month something or school programs or whatsoever. Mm-hmm. I don't think having a fence around an area is really important. I think it's important what you do, mm-hmm. and and if you have school programs uh, two months per year or three weeks per year and a festival it's what you do it's not 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 if it's a site or a museum i would say mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And then I have one last question. Um, so how old does a site need to be to be considered archaeological? Or like, That's cool. yeah, the research. So like, you know, Atlanta's history is young comparatively. <laughs> you know, you compare it to the thousand plus year old history of other countries. Uh, the United States is not only young, but also our city is quite young, but we are considered a, a historic site here, this mill. The resources for this mill only go back about 150 years uh, as far as architectural drawings, blueprints, things like that. If, if some of these structures had to be reconstructed using these old 150-year-old blueprints is that considered an archaeological reconstruction or well let me send you a link through the chat this is a place in denmark dated 1864 oh. and although i'm not so much in favor of sites about war i think this is a really good one and um, there's a little video there. I'm not going to turn it on because then you hear it. Uh, let, let me have a look if, if everything is there, what I want them to do. No, this is a, the, the first video is about the mill. That's not the one I need. Mean. Um, the second videos. Yes. If you if you go on that page, you, if you go down, the first video YouTube is about a mill. That's not interesting. The second video, which you see there, the second, the, the, the it's called the Battle for Als. Um, if you look at that later, okay. this is a, um, a a festival they do there once per year. Okay. And so this place is about 1864, which was uh, for Danish uh, uh, Danish people. Everybody knows about that year here. Because it was uh, there was a battle between let's say Germany, Austria, uh, Prussia on one side, Denmark on the other side about who who's taking over Denmark. So it was a quite dramatic period in in the country, and of Denmark was heroic, blah blah blah, and and that's what this site is about. 1864. That means they have a lot of historical sources, but they based them their their reconstructions. And also their living history, not only on historical sources, but also on archaeological sources. So battle, battlefield archaeology, I mean, battlefield archaeology, I mean, it can be World War II or even more recent. If you ask me the definition of when is something archaeology, that also depends, it is different per country. Hmm. Um, uh, where I come from, the Netherlands, officially everything older than 10 years and if it's in the ground is can be called archaeology a lot of people don't do that of course because hey a, a, a coke bottle of 10 years ago uh, 10 centimeters deep in the ground and you call that archaeology ha huh? difficult but theoretically mm -hmm. it's possible mm -hmm. and i would say um let's imagine there's a important event 20 years ago in amsterdam and uh, let's say a politician got shot and, and they will now excavate that site. It would be a bit weird, but it's still possible. Mm. Okay. So uh, I would say, uh, you can say, is archaeology an, an aid to history or history an aid to archaeology? Doesn't really matter. Okay. And, and in, in that sense, I would say, if you want to call yourself an archaeological site or archaeological interpretation site, then it's because you base yourself quite a bit on archaeology. I mean, there's a lot of industrial archaeology, mm -hmm. uh, 1870s, 1930s. Um, so the age doesn't really matter. I mean, I would myself say, well, I want the things I excavate to be of dead people. So not of my grandmother's generation, but older than that. But that's my personal feeling. Mm -hmm. There are people excavating World War II sites here in Europe. Yeah, one of the mills here, uh, while they were converting it during this adaptive reuse project, one of the mills caught on fire and almost completely burned, 
completely burned basically and got mm -hmm. uh the walls the exterior walls fell over so they they rebuilt it though from brick by brick uh using the old blueprints and by the time they finished reconstructing it it, it the exterior looked exactly like it had looked uh the interior is nowhere near how it had been originally but they essentially had to reconstruct an 1895 year old uh, a, a mill that was built in 1895 mm -hmm. and, you know whether that <laughs> falls into the realm of open air museum reconstruction of a historic structure or whether it's an archaeological rebuild i you know i these are things that we're mulling over and trying to figure out well let me let me try to find another link i'm staying in denmark so that's easy and let me find a link inside their website that will be better uh, they have probably a website in english good and let's see okay i'm going to send you a link to uh, a danish web this website is in english that's good it's called the Gambler Boo, which means the old town. Okay. And what they have, if you go down to remember the 1970s, that's uh, that part reconstructing the 1970s mm. is built 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And what they, for example, do there. Let's see if they have everything. Then maybe they don't have. They have quite a lot of uh, information there. What does what they, for example, do there is that um, people from old people's homes are uh, with dementia are brought there every now and then. Have a program there, feeling them. I mean, that's the nostalgia of their own gen of their own. Their memory comes back a bit, and they feel feel more comfortable in that area. So, it's a very good use of this ethnographic open air museum um this is historical there's not based not much maybe a little bit based on archaeology but it's i would say 90 percent based on 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 historical sources and this is one of the most well established danish open air museums hmm. what was that quote that you found nina that talks about if if you lose a particular structure, it takes away the meaning of the entire area, essentially. Like one building can make or break the, the raison d'etre for a community. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And not looking at my paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I just found that fascinating. The reason why I'm asking all these questions is because we run this nonprofit museum, which focuses, mm -hmm. of course, on this mill property as well as the entire neighborhood. And it, what you were saying earlier it really does come down to financing and money. And we are trying desperately to figure out how to have access to certain types of funding that could help preserve this property. Um, because over time, it's going to be harder and harder for residents to pay for it. So we're, we're trying to determine, like, how would the U.S. government in particular be willing to assist us <laughs> right um so my my yeah. thesis is part part thesis and part <laughs> proposal yeah for but, the homeowners association so but also how yeah. to structure our own nonprofits so that right. it is doing the best it can to tell the history i mean we're we're much more it's more it's education first and how to maintain the history mm -hmm. and the stories but there there is also going to be a need to finance this at some point um so i know that sounds <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not just about money but <laughs> yeah well um uh, i think uh, is that called a 503c in in the u.s yes 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 okay then then, then i then i remember that right um the usual thing with getting fund i mean let, let me give an example of, of 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 us trying to find funding we have a bridge just outside a property but it happened to be our bridge i found out that recently 
when it was already 30 years old and, and damaged and it should be replaced. And then I say, you will never get money for a new bridge because it's replacing an existing bridge while nobody wants to, No, there's not a single fund, not a single foundation or so wants to pay for that. And then we try to turn that into an activity, which is about um, um, old crafts, uh, saving old crafts and a mm. community projects. Mm. And I think I think it, it will work the same with you. You have good ideas about what you want to do. And accidentally, well, not accidentally, of course, accidentally, part of that money can be used I mean, at the end of the, the, the story, there's there, there's the product that you repaired something or, or made some new roads or whatsoever. I mean, next year we're going in the Arnau Museum, we're going to build a big uh, throwing machine. It's called a trebuchet. And okay. we try to get money indeed for a trebuchet, which is like, uh, well, I don't, I don't, let's see, uh, don't don't know how to say that in, in, in dollars. $300,000. $300, mm -hmm. My wife is better at math. <laughs> and uh, of course, we don't get money just to build it, to build that. No, we don't get three hundred thousand. And at the end, we have a little toy for ourselves standing there, especially because we already have one of those. Mm -hmm. But uh, we turn that into a, an activity. So uh, we have a half year program where we we invite uh, craft people from across the, or across Europe. Uh, we have projects with schools uh involving uh veterans and all that and mm -hmm. that we get money for mm -hmm. and that accidentally at the end of the project there's a trebuchet standing there for the next 30 years that's 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 enough you have to think around and if you have good ideas which which fit in in a long-term strategy um that I, I think that's also important that they see that you are stable. Uh, imagine that, uh, that, that, that they think that they will have in the back of the mind, what if those two, those two people get run over by a car? Will it still run? Will there still be something? How stable is that charity? Mm -hmm. How stable is the organization? And first of all, if your, your organization will be stable, if you indeed say, well, our five-year or 10-year plan, it doesn't have to be immensely detailed, is mm -hmm. this and this way this is our vision it's this way where, where we're going and then they're easier uh, eager uh, to invest uh, than if it's just help us with we have a house on fire please help us now mm -hmm. <laughs> right right did you have another question oh it just it just jog i mean it got my creative juices going um. that's all <laughs> the idea of having an event and then out of this event, you basically achieve something else that mm -hmm. was really the ultimate goal, mm -hmm. but the event was the means to mm -hmm. reach that end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I was just thinking what right. we could do in an industrial compound that used to use cotton for, <laughs> right. make cotton bags, you know, whatever. But uh, anyway. Yeah, well, I imagine you, you organize a school program uh, or uh, where you need uh, 60 cotton bags. Mm -hmm. I just named something. You, mm -hmm. you, you apply for money for the school program, you do the school program, and at the end you have some hardware. You have these bags which you can use for the next five years. Right. That's right. really cool. You may need to, re uh, oh. to leave the meeting and restart if you want to right. continue. Um, I'm, I'm actually out of, out of questions. I'm, o I'm okay. I'm okay. Are you okay, Jake? Do you have anything else? So, um, and... Hello. I'm the, I'm the blur in the background. Just well, his camera's not on. So. Oh. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. You know, that's, that's really cool. No, that's, that's good. That, I think that'll help us or help me. Um, over the home, so I'll help your proposal, and then I'll help my thesis. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think there's one thing I maybe also said last time. It's good to be part of the cultural infrastructure in your area. What what I mean that you know the other people who are doing some cultural things uh, nearby. That is the usual networking which which you need to to to. 
I, I, let, 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 let's also give it, and again a local example. I am totally new here in this in this country and in this city, mm. or it's, yeah, it's a city. It's not so big. Um, and then I decided, how do I get to how do I get contacts? So I joined the Rotary Club. It's not because I like the Rotary Club, um, but it's the easy way to get fast contacts, which which are quite useful uh, in the long run. Mm -hmm. And and I don't like to. They're not my friends. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of them will be my friends, but they're colleagues. They're I I need them for. I need to have a network. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And indeed, if I mean that's why I I went to the presentation of a book. Uh, the other day in the local museum mm -hmm. um the book is not really what i would normally read but the people are in, are, are uh, could be important mm -hmm. right right and and if if i may may say say something on the one hand if you write funding applications it's about writing the right things the other thing is about knowing the right people mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. and that I'm, I'm i'm sorry to say and i don't like it either I, I would wish I would get <coughs> sorry. I wish we would get money because we have good ideas, but sometimes we get money because we have goodwill. Right. Or you know people. Or we know people indeed. Right, right. Yeah. That's sage advice. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, yes. <laughs> We're learning. <laughs> yeah. Well thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I don't want to take up um any more of your with you evening um because i know it's it's going to be monday soon so um thank you thank you thank you thank you i'm sorry that there is yeah, there's, i'm just going to go to denmark and meet you and then we can talk <laughs> and then it'll be perfect uh you're welcome here anytime if, if you have All a right. chance to come to europe uh i would be very interested to hear how things are going and if you say um we should talk at another time i would be interested to know what you're what you're what you're, what you're doing thank you thank, thank you. you that'd be awesome um, but yeah, we'll, we'll definitely keep in touch and I appreciate, um, all of your advice and, uh, information and everything that you've done in the past month with this thesis.